Hi, I'm Tom, coming to you from Cleveland, Ohio. Thank you for selecting my video. In today's video, we will be exploring one of the most challenging aspects of sourdough baking for beginning bakers, and that is understanding the impact of temperature on bulk fermentation. Now, if you're like me, I'm a relatively new sourdough baker. I learned to bake bread during the winter. My kitchen temperature was very consistent. My loaves were very consistent. I had a process where I kept meticulous notes and it was easy to replicate the process, one loaf after another. And then my first summer as a sourdough baker rolled around and everything in all of my notes, everything that I knew about baking bread went completely out the window. My starter went crazy. My loaves started overproofing. My baking times all changed. My proofing times changed. I didn't know what was happening. This is really common for beginning sourdough bakers because until you actually experience it for the first time, it's hard to anticipate the impact of temperature on your bulk fermentation in your bread baking process. And the ability to master sourdough bread baking is really about mastering bulk fermentation. And mastering bulk fermentation is about mastering the impact of temperature and time. That's what this video is about. Now, in addition to dealing with seasonal changes, I also received many emails and comments from people on my other videos asking about how to adjust for baking times if you live in a warm climate in a tropical location or just in the middle of the summer if you don't run your air conditioning very frequently. So in this video, what we will focus on are all the tools and techniques that are available to be able to manage the impact of temperature on bulk fermentation. That includes finding ways to increase your dough temperature, finding ways to decrease your dough temperature, and being able to calculate the time adjustments required as the temperatures change. So in this video, I'll be doing an experiment where we'll be baking four loaves of bread at wildly different bulk fermentation temperatures and times with the intent of baking four loaves of bread that come out looking exactly the same at the end. This is by far the most challenging experiment I've ever attempted. I don't know if this will work. But basically what we will do is we're gonna bake four loaves of bread. The first loaf will be at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius. The second loaf will be at 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius. And the third and fourth loaves will be at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius. Those are the dough temperatures that I'll be exploring during bulk fermentation. For loaves three and four, which both bulk ferment at that same temperature, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, I'll then send those down two different paths. One will go into the refrigerator for a cold retard. The other one will do a countertop proof at a very warm room temperature. So among these four loaves, we'll have four wildly different attempts at doing bulk fermentation based on different temperatures and different time. If I can get all four of these loaves to come out looking exactly the same at the end, that will be evidence that I've mastered the art of bulk fermentation by using temperature and time. Hopefully at the end of this video, we'll be able to demonstrate the process and you will be able to master this as well. Now, if you're interested in this topic of bulk fermentation, I have some other videos that you should consider watching. The first one is called The Mystery of Bulk Fermentation. That's where I go through all the elements that impact bulk fermentation. I recommend watching that video first and then coming back to this video if you haven't seen that one yet. Another video I have is called Underproofed or Overproofed, a Tale of Four Loaves. And in that video, I bake four loaves of bread and I vary the bulk fermentation time, keeping the temperature the same. So if you're interested in just the impact of extending the time, that's a better video to watch. Then you could come back and watch this one when you're interested in varying the temperature. A third video that I have is called The Long Cold Proof. In that video, I bake six loaves of bread and I do a different cold proofing anywhere from one day to five days in the refrigerator. So if you're interested in assessing the final proofing step, that's a better video. This one is really about the bulk fermentation, not the final proofing as much. And then the last video in my Open Crumb series is called The Impact of Bulk Fermentation on Open Crumb. And that's where I look at the impact of different types of handling, such as coil folding, lamination, stretch and folds in the bulk fermentation process and understanding the impact that that has on the crumb. 
nothing really to do with time and temperature, but more about that other element of bulk fermentation, which is how you handle the dough. If you're interested in any of those topics, I recommend those other four videos. Now, in the other video that I mentioned, the mystery of bulk fermentation, I talk about six variables that impact bulk fermentation. And in that video, I go through those in great detail. In today's experiment, today's video, we're really gonna be focused on temperature primarily, time, which you can't separate from temperature when you're talking about bulk fermentation, and the percent rise in the dough. There are three variables that we won't be changing today that we'll be holding constant. Those are the type of flour. You can increase or decrease your bulk fermentation time depending on your mix of flours that you use. We'll be holding the flour uh, types constant through all these loaves. The second thing is the starter quantity and strength. I'll be using the same starter for all of these and the same ratio of starter for all of these. So we'll be holding that variable constant. And the third factor is the type of handling that you can do. You can actually speed up or slow down bulk fermentation by the type of handling. I'm gonna be handling all this dough the same way, so we'll eliminate that variable. So in this video, we'll be looking at temperature, time, and percent rise, primarily focused on the change in temperature. That's really the focus of this video. But we also have to look at the focus on changing the time because in bulk fermentation, those two things are inextricably linked. I will try to hold the percent rise constant, but I'll have to wait until we see what the dough looks like. But let's assume that the percent rise in the dough will be constant across all of these. So we're really just talking about varying temperature and time. Now you might say, that doesn't sound like a very good experiment because you're changing two variables at the same time. When you're doing bulk fermentation, those two things are inextricably linked. In all my other videos, I typically hold all the variables constant and only change one variable at a time. But when you think about what we're doing here, it doesn't make sense to, to do a, an experiment where we hold temperature constant and just vary the time because to finish bulk fermentation effectively, you need the time and temperature to match up. So if I just said, I'm gonna pick a temperature and do a short time, a medium time, and a long time with that temperature, I already know what the outcome will be. The short time will underproof, the medium time will proof properly, the long time will overproof. So that seems like a pretty obvious experiment. So this idea that you can separate time and temperature in bulk fermentation doesn't really work. And what we're focused on this in this experiment is mastering that interplay between time and temperature and understanding how both those variables work together that's really the art of bulk fermentation that we're going to explore in this video. Now let's talk about the tools that we need for this experiment. The first one obviously is you need a thermometer. We're gonna be taking the temperature a lot. We're gonna take the temperature every five minutes. So you need a good digital probe thermometer. I have this relatively expensive one. I splurged on this one because it takes the temperature a little bit faster. It's no more accurate than some of the other ones you can buy, but it's very quick, so it's good for these videos. So you don't have to watch me take the temperature and wait for five or six seconds every time for it to calibrate. These are some of the less expensive ones. These work perfectly fine. This is a very inexpensive digital probe thermometer. Here's kind of a moderately expensive one you could buy at a kitchen store. These all work. So you need a good digital probe thermometer. We're gonna be taking the temperature of the dough routinely throughout this entire process. It's very important to know what your dough temperature is. The second thing that I have are these things called refrigerator thermometers. These just measure the ambient air temperature. I keep one of these on my countertop at all times because I wanna know what my countertop temperature is. I keep one of these with my starter at all times because I wanna know what my starter temperature is. If you're using a proofing chamber, you absolutely wanna have one of these inside your proofing chamber at all times to know exactly what your proofing chamber temperature is. And when my loaves go into the refrigerator for the overnight cold retard, each loaf travels with its own thermometer. So I know what my refrigerator temperature is, exactly where the loaf is in the refrigerator. And you'll find that putting your loaves on a higher shelf or a lower shelf in the refrigerator, putting it in the front of the refrigerator, or the back of the refrigerator, you'll see a big difference in the refrigerator temperature, which can actually impact that overnight fermentation. So I recommend having a number of these. I have about six of them. You can buy three or four of these for $12 US dollars on the internet. They're really not expensive. And I'll show you how I use these throughout the process. These are invaluable. 
The third type of thermometer that I'll use in this experiment, I don't use these very often, but this is a continuous measurement thermometer like the one you would use when you're making your Thanksgiving turkey. I'm gonna actually put this inside my loaf when I put it into the refrigerator and we're going to monitor the internal dough temperature once our loaves go into the refrigerator to see exactly what's happening in terms of the temperature so we know what's happening in terms of fermentation when it goes into the cold retard. You can also use these inside your proofing chamber so you don't have to be opening and closing the door of your proofing chamber all the time. You can continuously monitor the temperature or if you're doing a countertop final proof, sometimes it's helpful to use this to understand how quickly your dough temperature is acclimating to your room temperature. So these are handy to use from time to time. This is another type of continuous read thermometer. It's kind of a high tech version. My wife just got this for me. This is a Bluetooth and Wi-Fi enabled probe thermometer. So I can put this inside my dough, put it into my proofing chamber. I can go sit on my couch and watch TV. I can pull my phone out and check my dough temperature right here on my phone. That's pretty cool. I'm gonna do that a little bit today. The next dimension that we're gonna measure is the percent rise. Now for this experiment, I wanna be very accurate in measuring the percent rise because I wanna be able to create a chart of these three different bulk fermentation temperatures that we'll be using to see what that curve looks like so we can measure the percent rise and get a feel for what the, the rise curve looks like at, at the low, medium, and high bulk fermentation temperatures. So we wanna be very accurate in measuring the percent rise. This is what most people use for their bulk fermentation. This doesn't work. I mean, when you use a big flat bottom bowl like this that flares out at the top, and I'm trying to measure 5%, 15%, 25% rise in the dough, you just can't do it in a bowl like this. It just doesn't work. Because as the dough rises, the bowl is spreading out, so the height is not equal to the volume. The volume is actually increasing faster than the height is increasing. And when you're trying to measure a small percent change like that, it's almost impossible to do it in a big flat bottom bowl like that. So what a lot of people use is something like this, more of a straight walled vessel. This isn't exactly straight walled, but it has the milliliter markers on it and it's almost a straight walled vessel. This is really the best type of vessel for bulk fermentation because the height is roughly equal to the change in volume. And when we talk about the percent rise in bulk fermentation, it's the percent change in volume, not the percent change in height, unless you have a straight walled vessel where the change in volume equals the change in height. This also has the milliliter markers on it because this isn't exactly straight walled, it's pretty close. But I wanna be super accurate. So for this experiment, I actually bought some of these chemistry beakers, perfectly straight walled vessel with small increment milliliter markers on them. I'm gonna use these for today's experiment so that we can get an exact measurement in the change in the percent rise in the dough hour by hour so we have a really good record of what it looks like at the three different bulk fermentation temperatures. I have a friend of mine, Richard Falkenberg, who's a school teacher and when I told him I was doing this experiment and I bought these beakers, he said, oh, I have something for you. And he went down in his basement and he brought up this spectacular beaker set, which I'm also gonna use just because it's kind of cool and interesting. Uh, he didn't remember how long ago he bought these, but they're pretty old. But So when I looked at one, I got a sense for how old these were because this one says made in West Germany. The young people will have to look that one up on the internet to see back when there used to be two Germanys. Uh, so I'm gonna use these beakers as well for measuring water and things of that nature. And then lastly, the last variable that we're measuring is time by a watch. Look at a clock, use your phone. I like to use this old fashioned electromechanical kitchen timer. Uh, we're gonna keep records throughout this process. So we wanna know really every 30 minutes throughout the process, what's the temperature, what's the percent rise, what's the time. These are the three things we're using, thermometer, straight walled vessel, and a timer. Now, before we proceed with this video, I have a final warning. This is your last chance to exit. If you do not like science, if you don't like measuring things, if you don't like taking temperatures, if you like to bake bread solely by the feel of the bread or by listening to the dough, this is not the right place for you. You are not gonna be happy here. We're gonna take the temperature about 200 times. We're gonna be measuring things in grams. 
milliliters and centimeters. We're going to be using charts and graphs to make bread. This is probably the most scientific bread baking video that you'll find on the internet. So if you're just not into that, this is not the right place for you. Now, one of the most important techniques for managing your dough temperature and bulk fermentation is using a proofing chamber. Now, a proofing chamber is quite simply just an enclosed space in your kitchen where you can make the temperature of the enclosed space different than your kitchen temperature. So the, what, the thing that a lot of people use for a proofing chamber is they'll use their oven with the light turned on in the oven, the heat turned off, and just the heat that emits from the light bulb will raise that oven temperature a few degrees. For example, mine will get up to about 86 degrees Fahrenheit or 30 degrees Celsius, which is a good proofing temperature for my dough typically. That's usually the first thing I would recommend is take one of these thermometers, turn the light on in your oven, let it sit for an hour or so to see what that temperature would get to. So the way that you would use that is if your room temperature is say 75 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 24 degrees Celsius, and you're trying to proof your dough using the tartine method, for example, which calls for 78 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 25.5 to 28 degrees Celsius, I need to raise my room temperature. I need to raise my dough temperature. So during bulk fermentation, I turn the light on in my oven about an hour before I need to start, put my dough covered in there, and then I'll keep that at a warm temperature. Other things that people use for proofing chambers are, you can buy a proofing chamber. There's a company called Broden Taylor that makes a foldable proofing chamber that you can store away under your cabinet. And then when you need it, you pop it open, you put the lid on, you put your dough in, you turn the thermostat and it keeps your dough at the, at the perfect temperature. Very easy to use, uh, but those are kind of expensive. So a lot of people try to improvise in their kitchen before they'll spend the money on something like that. And it's another kitchen appliance that you have to store. So the oven with the light on is the most common method. I have a warming drawer down here under my counter. Uh, this actually has a proof setting on it, but the lowest I can get this temperature to for when it, even on the proof setting is about 95 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 35 degrees Celsius. And you'll find this on warming drawers, ovens, toaster ovens, they may have a proof setting on them, but always measure that temperature with your thermometer before you put your dough in there, because most of those are calibrated for commercial yeast proofing, which can be much higher than sourdough proofing. So if you just press the proofing button on your oven and put your dough in there, it'll start to cook it. It'll start to overproof because it'll typically be over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Other ideas that people use for proofing chambers is you can buy a seed warming mat. You'll find these in garden centers uh, and you can put uh, that underneath your bowl and it'll heat up your, your bowl of dough. Some people use reptile warming mats that you can buy at a pet store and you can use that to heat up the bottom of your bowl or you can put it inside a box and create your own proofing chamber. Some people use their microwave with the light turned on in the microwave oven. If you just leave the door ajar on your microwave, it'll cause the light to turn on. My microwave doesn't give off enough heat just from that light bulb for that to be an effective proofing chamber, but some people do use that. Really any enclosed space uh, in your home with a heating element, you can use that to create a proofing chamber. So let's say none of these things are working for you. Your, your light in your oven might be broken. You might not be able to repair that. So you need to figure out some other way to create a proofing chamber. The easiest way to do it, and I do this all the time, is by using boiling water. If you just heat up a kettle of water on your stove to boiling or put this in the microwave and bring it to a boil, this will create a heating element. So for example, if I put one liter of boiling water into my oven, it'll raise my oven temperature by about 16 degrees Fahrenheit which is nine degrees Celsius. The same thing if I put this in my microwave. Boiling water, one liter of boiling water, it'll raise my microwave internal temperature by 16 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's say that's too hot and I only need to raise it, say, nine or 10 degrees, I use a half a liter of boiling water. That would raise my temperature nine degrees in my microwave or four degrees Celsius. So by using 
less water, you can raise the temperature less. By using more water, you raise the temperature more. And then this will cool down over time, so you need to refresh it from time to time. But this is a real easy, inexpensive way to create a proofing chamber. Similarly, if you need to cool down your dough or your starter, for example, let's say it's incredibly warm out, it's incredibly warm in your kitchen, and you want to keep your starter at a slightly lower temperature than your room temperature to slow down the activity in your starter, you can use a styrofoam cooler or a plastic cooler and put one kilogram of ice in a cooler and that'll drop the temperature about 10 degrees Fahrenheit from room temperature or five degrees Celsius. I created this chart, which you can see on the screen, that just shows some of these examples. I won't read all of them off, but I did experiments with one liter of water in my oven and my microwave, one liter and a half a liter of ice in a cooler, and it shows you what the impact is on those different um, proofing chamber options. Now, one of the primary tools for managing dough temperature is something called the desired dough temperature calculation. You can find this in Jeffrey Hamelman's bread book. You can find a calculator on the King Arthur website. You can find a calculator on Maurizio Leo's Perfect Loaf website. But basically what this formula does is that if you, not, if you are trying to hit a target temperature, for example, in the tartine recipe, I try to hit 80 degrees Fahrenheit, this will take the temperature of the known ingredients, put those into a formula, and it'll calculate what your water temperature should be so that when you blend in your water temperature, after the mixing, your dough will be at the desired dough temperature. So this is a great tool when you're trying to really set up your bulk fermentation and you have a target fermentation temperature in mind. Now, I'll give a few examples of this formula. I'm not gonna go through it in step-by-step -step detail because you can read about this on your own. But basically in the desired dough temperature calculation, there are two versions of it. There's a three-factor version and a four-factor version. The three-factor version you would use when you're using commercial yeast or when you have a very small quantity of starter. The four-factor method accounts for a starter 11 or a pre-ferment. So going through the basics of the formula, the way these all work is you take your desired temperature that you're trying to hit. In this example, I'm using 80 degrees Fahrenheit and I'll do these calculations in Fahrenheit for simplicity. And then I'll show the results in Celsius at the end. You multiply that by the factor, meaning the number of variables that you're using in the equation. Then you subtract out your flour temperature, your le leaven temperature, if you're using the four factor method, your room temperature and something called the friction factor and that will give you your calculated water temperature at the bottom of the chart. Now the friction factor, I have that set here to zero because this formula was really developed in commercial bakeries where you're using a power mixer and that action of the arm or the hook or the auger basically creates friction in the flour and it will actually generate heat in your dough as you're mixing it, particularly if you're mixing it for a longer period of time. In sourdough baking at home, where we're doing hand mixing of a small quantity of flour for a fairly short period of time, the friction factor is usually recommended to be zero. So that's why I've set that for zero in this formula. Now I used this method when I first started baking and I had very inconsistent results with this. This method is really tailored more for commercial bakeries because it accounts for that friction factor. It doesn't account for different hydration levels in your dough. It doesn't account for different quantities of starter in your dough. It basically treats it the same regardless of what your specific recipe is. So I tended to get some real inconsistencies when I was using this approach. So I've created another formula called the desired dough temperature calculation. And this is a gram weighted calculation, very simplistic concept. I take the temperature of my flour times the grams of my flour the temperature of my starter times the grams of my starter. I know the grams of my water, so I can back into very simply what the water temperature should be to get all those to average out to the average dough temperature. It's a very simplistic calculation, but it works, but it's easy to understand. Now using that method, the only problem is that the density and molecular structure of water is different than the density and molecular structure of the flour and the starter. So when you're blending 
ingredients like that, it's not a simple arithmetic formula because the densities are different. So what I've done is I've created an adjusted version of that. That's the fourth method here, which is what I call the density adjusted desired dough temperature calculation. I'll put that on the screen for a minute. And what you can see I'm doing here is I'm adjusting the flour for its density of 0.6 relative to water. I'm adjusting the leaven at 0.8 for its density relative to water. And I do the calculation based on that adjusted weight, if you will, accounting for the density. This formula has proven to be very accurate. When we compare the four methods together, the two standard methods and my two methods that I've created, I mean, just look at the differences here. There's quite a wide difference in the calculated water temperature going as high as 95 degrees Fahrenheit, 35 degrees Celsius in the four factor method down to 84 degrees Fahrenheit and 29 degrees Celsius in the density adjusted method. That's a big difference in those temperatures and you would get a very big difference in your dough temperature if you use the high or the low water temperatures in those four examples. So I know this is a lot of formulas and a lot of math and a little bit complicated. So what I've done is I've created a worksheet where I can just punch in the known variables and it will automatically calculate using all four of these methods. So this is what we'll do in the rest of the video. Each time in the experiment, as I mix up the batches of dough, I'll put the known factors in, we'll calculate it all four ways, and then we'll compare those methods for each one of the batches and we'll compare the outcome. That's really a better way to learn about these different methods. So the recipe that I follow for this and all of my experimental videos is the Tartine Bread Basic Country Loaf recipe. If you're not familiar with that, let me give you the quick rundown. This recipe is a thousand gram flour weight recipe that normally makes two full size loaves. I divide those in half and I make four loaves out of a thousand grams of flour. So these are 250 gram flour weight recipes. The flour is 90% bread flour, 10% whole wheat flour. In today's experiment, I'm using King Arthur bread flour and King Arthur whole wheat flour. It calls for 750 grams of water, 200 grams of leaven or starter, and 20 grams of salt. So using the baker's percentages off the 1,000 gram flour weight, it's 75% water, 20% leaven, 2% salt. That leaven is a 100% hydration leaven, and it's usually made the night before. If you follow the tartine process, it calls for a young leaven built overnight at a cool temperature the night before. I don't believe that's germane to the outcome of this experiment, but just for the record, I wanted to mention that. Now, the one area where I will deviate from the tartine bread basic country loaf recipe is that this recipe calls for the uh, stretch and fold process. So during bulk fermentation, we typically would do five to six stretch and folds with 30 minute intervals. Because in this experiment, I want to very carefully measure the percent rise in the dough, I don't wanna to touch this dough during bulk fermentation. So what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna do a little bit of hand mixing on the front end of bulk fermentation to try to build some gluten up front because we're gonna be avoiding the stretch and fold process. And then I'm just going to let this dough bulk ferment untouched during the bulk fermentation process so that we can really measure the percent rise without touching the dough because every time you touch the dough during bulk fermentation you degas the dough and it impacts the measurement of the percent rise so i want to eliminate that variable and then in addition to that this recipe calls for pre-shaping 30 minute bench rest and final shaping before going into the refrigerator or onto the countertop for the final proof we're not going to be doing any shaping of these loaves so what i want to do is really focus only on bulk fermentation and at the end of bulk fermentation, I'm gonna take these loaves, basically put them into shaping baskets, but I'm not going to do pre-shaping or final shaping. And the reason is because I wanna assess the impact of what we're doing with time and temperature on the crumb coming out of bulk fermentation. Once we start handling the dough to do pre-shaping and final shaping, you can introduce a lot of irregularities into the crumb. And if we really wanna demonstrate mastery of bulk fermentation, Bulk fermentation ends at the end of bulk fermentation. So I'm just gonna cut it off, put these in shaping baskets, put them in the refrigerator overnight, and then bake them up the next morning. And if all of these loaves bulk fermented exactly the same way, all four loaves will look exactly the same when we take them out of the oven. And I've done this before. 
with no pre-shaping and no final shaping, these, actually, these loaves actually will look pretty good. It's surprisingly uh, good how these loaves come out without those last two steps involved in the process. Now let's briefly talk about what happens in bulk fermentation. In bulk fermentation, two things are happening. One, we're building gluten structure, and two, we're allowing the yeast to fill the gluten matrix with carbon dioxide. That's really what bulk fermentation is all about. Now in this example, because we're not doing the stretching and folding, you might say, how does the gluten structure get built? There are two ways that gluten gets built. One is through a chemical process. When you just add flour and water together, it, it causes the proteins in the flour to bind to create gluten through a chemical reaction. So you can create gluten in your bread without touching it all. That's, that's the chemical creation of gluten. We assist that through the stretching and folding process by stretching the dough. It helps create more gluten. So I'm actually going to do some hand mixing at the beginning of this process because we're not going to be doing stretching and folding as I mentioned earlier. But the other thing to remember is that as the yeast is aerating the dough, the yeast is also stretching the dough millions and millions of times. It's doing something called micro kneading. That's how you can do a, a purely hands-off, no knead loaf where you just mix the dough and let it sit overnight. It'll still create gluten because it does it through chemistry and through that micro kneading of the yeast. We're gonna rely on the micro kneading a little bit more than the traditional stretch and fold method to build the gluten. But those are the two things that happen in bulk fermentation. So all we're really doing is coaching the yeast along to make sure that it has enough food in the flour and enough time in the bulk fermentation process to fully proof the loaf. If you don't give the yeast enough time, you underproof the loaf. If, they get, if you give it too much time, you overproof the loaf. So really bulk fermentation is simply about finding that sweet spot where you cut off the timing, where the yeast has just given its last gasp of energy and it's perfectly proofed the loaf. That's what we're trying to find. That's nirvana. That's really the, the holy grail of bulk fermentation is finding that perfect end point where you cut it off and the yeast has fully proofed the loaf exactly. So now let's talk about the impact of temperature on bulk fermentation. Now this is where things get complicated. So the one thing that's very obvious is that when the temperature increases, bulk fermentation happens faster. Everybody learns that the first time they overproof a loaf, when th your dough just runs away from you. But the real question is, how much faster does, does the fermentation occur with incremental changes in temperature? That's really the challenge, and that's what we're going to try to figure out through these experiments, is really to try to come up with a model where you could calculate or estimate how much faster will the bulk fermentation occur based on changes in temperature. Now there are some, I'd say, rules of thumb out there among sourdough bakers where people say that bulk fermentation or fermentation doubles with a 15 degree Fahrenheit change or an eight degree Celsius change in temperature, you'll see a doubling in the fermentation time. So for example, that would mean if I bulk fermented a loaf at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius, and it took six hours, and then I went up to 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 degrees Celsius, it should take three hours. That would imply a doubling with that 15 degree Fahrenheit or eight degree Celsius change in temperature. I can tell you from experience, it moves much faster than that. If, if, if something bulk fermented in six hours at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, it would bulk ferment much faster than three hours at the 90, 90 degree Fahrenheit. So I know that that formula may be a general rule of thumb, but it has not been scientifically proven, at least in my experience. So what we're hoping to do in this video is to come up with something a little bit more scientifically provable. So now let's just try to understand what's happening when the temperature changes and how that impacts the yeast production. So yeast is a temperature sensitive organism. Yeast doesn't know what time it is. It can't read a clock, but it knows what the temperature is. And it's very simple. If you increase the temperature, the yeast will speed up. And all the yeast does is it eats starches and sugars 
and it creates ethanol and carbon dioxide. That's all it does. And it's almost like if you could put yeast on a treadmill and say that you could control the speed of the treadmill by increasing the temperature. So at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius, the yeast is kind of strolling along. 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius, all I did was turn up the temperature. The treadmill actually speeds up and the yeast starts running faster. 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, I turn the temperature up again, the treadmill speeds up even more, the yeast just keeps running faster. So you can control how quickly the yeast consumes starches and sugars by controlling the temperature. But there's another factor involved because that relationship is not linear. It's not as if you say, if I increase the temperature by 10%, then the fermentation will increase by 10%. Or if I increase the temperature by 20%, the speed of the yeast production will increase by 20% because it's nonlinear, it's exponential. So here's what happens is that at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius, the yeast, mm, it's eating at a slow pace. You turn the temperature up, to 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius, it eats faster. You turn the temperature up to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, it eats even faster. But it's not linear because as the yeast is eating faster, it's also reproducing faster. So here's what's actually happening. At 75 degrees Fahrenheit, the yeast is eating and it's reproducing. At 82 degrees Fahrenheit, the yeast eats faster, but it also reproduces faster. At 90 degrees Fahrenheit, the yeast eats even faster and reproduces faster. So at the higher temperatures, you have more yeast cells eating faster. That's what creates the exponential curve of fermentation. And that's what makes it very difficult to predict what's happening either at high temperatures or late in the fermentation process because what's happening in the first 30 minutes of bulk fermentation is very different than what's happening in the last 30 minutes of bulk fermentation, even at the same temperature, because you have so many more yeast cells at that point in time. So the last 30 minutes of bulk fermentation, you might be getting two or three times the fermentation activity that you're getting in the first 30 minutes. And then similarly, at higher temperatures, 30 minutes at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius, you're not at much risk of overproofing if something goes 30 minutes too long or 30 minutes too short. When you're up at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, 30 minutes can make or break your dough. You can literally see your dough overproof in 30 minutes when you're operating at that 90 degree Fahrenheit, 32 degree temperature. So that's what makes this complicated is that the later you get in the fermentation process and the higher temperature that you're operating at, these factors compound on each other, and that's where the overproofing typically runs away from people, is late in the process and or at higher temperatures. Another way to think about this is at 75 degrees Fahrenheit or 24 degrees Celsius, it's like the yeast is out for a, a nice stroll on a summer day. It's not even breaking a sweat. You turn that temperature up to 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius, the yeast is doing a little bit of a light jog. It's huffing and puffing a little bit, starting to break a sweat. You turn that temperature up to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, it's like the yeast is in a mosh pit at a summer concert. It's like Studio 54 in August of 1977. The young people will have to look that one up on the internet to see what that was all about. But it's hot, it's sweaty, and the yeast is going crazy. Now, one of the most important things to understand when you're working with sourdough at high temperatures is understanding something called the protease enzyme. Now, you might ask, what is this? I've never heard of this. Because normally when you talk about sourdough, you talk about the microbes in your sourdough starter. People know about yeast. They know about lactic acid bacteria. There's another party involved here. It's called the protease enzyme. The protease enzyme is what actually breaks down the gluten in your dough that causes an overproofed loaf to completely fall apart. And if you've really overproofed a loaf before or overproofed dough before, where you can't even pick it up, it's just breaking apart in your hands, that is the result of the protease enzyme. The protease enzyme is what causes the classic collapsing of the dough 
in overproofing. It eats the gluten. It eats the gluten matrix. It eats the grid that the, the yeast is trying to fill. It is the protease enzyme that causes this problem. At normal proofing temperatures, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius, the protease enzyme stays on a leash. It, it's very well controlled and it usually doesn't really show up in the process. But when your temperature increases in your dough, it activates the protease enzyme and it will start to show up all over the place. So when we start doing this fermentation at higher temperatures, 85 degrees Fahrenheit, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, the protease enzyme shows up and it causes a lot of problems at that high temperature. So when you think about the impact of temperature on how these microbes behave, I like to think about it like this. At 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius, the yeast is having a very civilized tea party in the dining room. The lactic acid bacteria is like the young adults. They're in the basement, they're watching television, but everything's pretty much under control. You turn the temperature up to 85 degrees, somebody takes a flask of whiskey out and starts to spike the teacups in the dining room and the yeast starts to get a little crazy. The young people start to turn up the stereo in the basement and get a little rowdy. They might be doing a little drinking down there. You turn the temperature up to 90 degrees Fahrenheit and all hell breaks loose. I mean, the yeast starts dancing on the dining room table. The young people come up from the basement with a keg of beer and start doing beer bongs in the kitchen. And they bring an uninvited party guest, the protease enzyme. At 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, the protease enzyme shows up. They start breaking the furniture. They start punching holes in the wall. They start a fire in your kitchen. I mean, they wreck the place. That's what causes your loaf to deteriorate is that protease enzyme is just completely unhinged and it just wrecks the place. You are always at danger of that at high temperatures. So we have to be incredibly careful to watch out for that when we're bulk fermenting at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius. Now, when we talk about making bread at high temperature, one of the most important things to remember, maybe the most important thing, is that you'll have to learn how to bulk ferment dough at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius. You're occasionally gonna have a day like that. But the thing you always have to remember, this is my starter, is never ever let your starter get up to that high temperature of 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius. Because this is so highly concentrated with the microbes that when this gets up to a high temperature, it releases so much acidity and the protease enzyme in such a highly concentrated manner that if you add your starter to your dough when it's at that high temperature, you're adding so much acid and so much of the protease enzyme to it that it'll break down the dough right from the start. And some of you have probably seen this before where you're not even halfway through bulk fermentation and your dough has already fallen apart it's because your starter or your leaven was too far along when you started. When people talk about overproofing loaves, I've overproofed loaves two ways. There's kind of the classic overproofing where you leave it on the countertop at room temperature for 18 hours and it ultimately will break down after that period of time. I've had dough fall apart in my hands during bulk fermentation and it's because of this. It's because my starter got too hot. If I let this starter get up to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and then I add this starter that's supercharged with that protease enzyme, and I put this into my bowl of virgin flour and water, and I add this starter to it that's bursting with protease enzyme, it's like a bacchanalian orgy. It's gonna start to eat the gluten as soon as the gluten is starting to form, and you don't even get through bulk fermentation. You have a sloppy pile of dough. It's because your starter went too far before you began the process. Keep your starter cool. I try to keep this below, say 85 degrees is the maximum that I would let my starter get up to, 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Once you get up beyond that, and you'll start to notice, it'll start to liquefy. I actually did this, I heated this up to show you. When your starter is up above that 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, and it liquefies like this, never ever put this into your dough. This is just overproofing your dough right from the start. This is a recipe for overproofing. If somebody said, I wanna try to overproof a loaf as fast as possible, I would say, heat up your starter 
to about 90, 95 degrees Fahrenheit, 32, 34 degrees Celsius. Wait till it liquefies, pour this into your flour and water mixture, you'll overproof your dough within two hours. Now for today's experiment, we will be baking four loaves of bread with different bulk fermentation temperatures and times. So let's talk about these in a little bit more detail. For all four of these loaves, I follow the Tartine Bread Basic Country Loaf recipe. This is a fairly well-known recipe. I use this recipe in all of my experimental videos. So this is a constant across all my videos. We'll do the same here today. Now let's talk about the four loaves. Loaf number one, we will bulk ferment this one at 75 degrees Fahrenheit or 24 degrees Celsius. You can think of this as a moderate room temperature bulk fermentation, very typical in a lot of recipes that you may find. We will shoot for a 30% rise in the dough, which is what's recommended in the tartine recipe. I'll have to evaluate that as we go and just see what the dough looks like when it hits that 30% rise at the different temperatures, but I'll try to hold that variable constant after we hit that target percent rise and bulk fermentation is done, we don't know how long the time will take. That's the variable that we're really gonna be managing here is time. And then we'll put those into proofing baskets and loaf number one will go into the refrigerator for an overnight cold retard. Loaf number two, we'll bulk ferment this at 82 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 28 degrees Celsius. That's the high end of the bulk fermentation range recommended in the, in the tartine bread recipe. It's very typical with what I normally bake, 80 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit bulk fermentation. I don't know how long that one will take. I have an idea because this is the most common time and temperature that I typically use for my bulk fermentation. When, bulk, when loaf number two is completed, that will go into the refrigerator for an overnight cold retard as well. Loaves number three and four, we're going to bulk ferment these at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius. This is really pushing the limits, but this is going to demonstrate what it's like to do warm weather baking, what it's like to do bulk fermentation in a tropical climate or in the middle of summer in your kitchen when it's very warm. So this is the challenging one. So we're gonna do two loaves at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius. When those loaves have risen, at that target of approximately 30%. These two will go in two different directions. Loaf number three will go into the refrigerator with loaf number one and two for an overnight cold retard. Loaf number four, we're gonna do a countertop room temperature final proof and bake that one up. So this will also give us another variable that we can look at, which is what's the difference between a cold retard and a countertop uh, proof at room temperature. So this will be an interesting comparison, especially with that very warm loaf, because it will want to proof very quickly at room temperature. So this will be a good test as well. Those are the four loaves. As I mentioned, this is the most challenging experiment I've ever tried. I don't know if it's gonna work, but we're gonna give it a shot. Now, I just wanna clarify one thing here, because I know I have very astute subscribers on YouTube who watch all these details of my videos, and they often, point out small errors and inconsistencies that I make in these videos. Now what I'm doing here is I'm actually baking these loaves at different times because I have to be working at different, essentially room temperatures. Then through the magic of video editing, I'm gonna edit all these back to make it look like I'm doing these at the same time. So there will be some inconsistencies where my proofing chamber immediately goes from 75 degrees to 85 degrees. And you'll wonder how did he do that? It's because I'm actually spacing these out and doing them at little bit different times over a 36 hour period, which also involves getting up in the middle of the night to make my leaven and bake some of this bread, but all in the interest of science. So the purpose of this experiment is we're gonna take these wildly different temperatures as are given in each one of these scenarios, and then we're gonna modify time to try to deliver a perfect loaf under all four of these scenarios. This is challenging. I mean, think about it. Some, one of these loaves is going to bulk ferment for eight to 12 hours, another one for four to six hours, another one for two to four hours. Some of these will go into the refrigerator for 12 to 15 hours overnight. One of them will sit on the countertop for probably three to four hours. And at the end, all four of these loaves should come out looking exactly the same. That's the goal. That's when you've really mastered bulk fermentation. When you can take any temperature that somebody throws at you and you can say, I know how to deal with this, and I'm gonna use the tools that I have available to me to modify the time 
and manage the bulk fermentation to get the exact same looking loaf regardless of the bulk fermentation temperature. This is challenging. This is the hardest experiment I've ever done. I really hope it works.